be available um, on a blog once we um, get it rendered out and post up, and we'll send everybody who has attended um, an email and let them know um, when that's available. So until uh, Dale jumps on, George, we'll just have you kind of uh, take the presentation over. If we can get Dale back online um, on the audio, then we'll just have him join the conversation. So go ahead and get started here. Um, so this is the okay. do's and don'ts of mapping. Um, we're we're going to be addressing uh, time and life-saving tips. Um, this is sponsored by Laser Technology. We have some guest speakers uh, that we'll be introducing here just in a few seconds. You can just advance the slide here. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this particular uh, webinar, this is the third webinar out of four. We hope you are returning guests here online. Um, we do have another webinar um, in May that we'll be announcing and um, talking about at the end. But uh, by attending this webinar for the full hour, um, you will be able to submit a continuing education credit through ACTAR. Um, and then we've, we've noticed in the last couple of webinars we've had, some people were interested in just having a um, a complete, um, you know, certificate of completion, um, but aren't interested necessarily in the ACTAR credit, uh, we can do that as well. So let's see. Um, so how do you receive my credit? So basically, I'm going to open up a quick poll just to get started here, and if we could. Um, just get people to use the poll. So you should be able to see the question on the far right um, of your screen. It says, are you interested in submitting for a complete um, certification? So this is not necessarily for ACTAR. This is maybe just for your department um, that you did participate in today's webinar. And this will give us an indication of um, making you a certification of completion for, for this webinar attending. So if you are interested in that, please use that polling for the, for the yes or no. And um, we'll leave that open for a sec, just so we have a clear indication of who is interested in uh, um, of receiving a certificate. This will be in a PDF form, and this will be emailed to you. We have your email um, from your registration, so it should be no problem on getting that to you. Dale, I see that you're um, chatting with me about how you can hear us, but you're still going to need to uh, phone in on that original phone call. If you hit that audio button on your screen on the upper left or the lower left corner, you're going to have to physically call in. You may be hearing us through your computer, um, but for us to hear you, you'll have to call in. All right, so it looks like for the polling, um, I think everyone has uh, made some answers. We're going to go ahead and close that poll here in just a about 20 seconds. So again, if you're interested in that uh, certification of completion, um, we will get that to you absolutely right away. All right. All right, so just uh, jumping on then to the next slide, um, we'll go ahead and um, Polls should be closed, so George, go ahead and jump to the next slide there. All right, so today's objective is what we're going to hit as far as just the overall outline of what we're going to address today. Um, you know, we're talking about just learning about, again, those time and life-saving tips when mapping a, um, a crash scene, and that's going to be kind of our focus today. So we're talking about, you know, preloading some features within your software. Uh, you know, commonly mapped features that you um, would use all the time, so you can kind of use a pick list. Um, you know, photographing the scene, just some tips and tricks there. You know, obviously just shooting the evidence and just kind of the mythology behind that um, and some good tips. You know, setting up your equipment. Um, you know, we're talking about the battery of backups. You know, if you lose battery power of your um, instruments, your data collector, um, it, that definitely will uh, Pull you down and just, you know, some quality check tips, of course, when you're on scene before you leave. And then, you know, just a really great tips about how to save your data. So these are all just going to be um, addressed today uh, with our guest speakers. With, and with that said, we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. And uh, George, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. This is George McLaris, uh, retired from the San Diego PD about a year and a half ago. Did 35 years in law enforcement with almost 25 years in traffic division. I retired as the lead reconstructionist for the city of San Diego. 
I also have my own company where I teach Crash Zone and also laser mapping. And with that, I turn it over to Dale Farmer. Yeah, I still think we're ahead. Oh, there you go, Dale. Um, actually, I don't believe we have uh, audio still from Dale. So I think for right now, uh, Dale, if you can, uh, again, try to call in that presentation, we can hopefully have you join us. But we'll go ahead and just uh, move on with the content uh, with George for now. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how you prepare yourself before you arrive on scene. And with that being said, that kind of leads into the next slide as far as your equipment. Uh, Make sure you have all your equipment in one area. Uh, make sure your software is not only installed, but up to date on whatever device you're using. And then of course, make sure you have all your additional supplies you're gonna need. I like to keep all my stuff in one case, um, as far as my paint, lumber crayons, tape measures, evidence markers, additional prisms, any type of uh, rubber photo markers that you might use uh, to lay down the roadway. I always like to make sure that my device will open and I can actually see the software. Um, I've experienced over the years agencies calling with technical problems and sometimes it's actually because somebody just failed to plug in their data collector and the battery round down and then there was no charge. So as we talk about power issues, you know, you got to make sure that you keep your equipment fully charged. Do you have extra batteries? Do you have access to portable generator or a jump box? Uh, I've seen some departments that actually have small Honda generators because they're quiet, which can provide power to whatever you may need. I personally carried a Duracell jump box that actually had a switch where I had two AC plugs and it provided me power for my data collector. That was usually my biggest issue with my data collector. As far as uh, my mapping equipment, um, I either was able to use consumable batteries such as C-cell batteries or I had other batteries where I can hot swap. But most data collectors have internal batteries where you can actually swap the batteries on the fly and just keep shooting. So I think that's a very important thing is how you're going to deal with battery issues. And then here on this slide, it's just uh, three photographs I took of all my equipment. You can see actually that I carry quite a bit of equipment. I've been mapping scenes for quite some time now, and I've found that uh, I use a lot of different things. It just depends on the scene. So here you can see that I have that Duracell jump box that is in the center picture towards the right. And then of course I have my mapping equipment. I have extra batteries, extra tape measures, several data collectors, evidence markers, of course, extra cables. Um, if you're still connecting with cable and not doing Bluetooth, I started this long before Bluetooth was uh, dependable. Of course, your markers, any paint, nails, PK nails, stickers, whatever it is that you may use. I keep them in the secured boxes that uh, are airtight so moisture doesn't get in. So that's personally what I use. Awesome, man. It looks like uh, we actually have Dale now online. So Dale, um, let's just go ahead and have you introduce yourself. And if you have anything just to add to, to what George has already said, that'd be great. Yeah, uh, Dale Farmer, Farmer Police and Analysis out of Churchill, Tennessee. I apologize for getting offline. I've had all kinds of internet trouble. Uh, I agree with everything that George has said so far. You run across these issues by not being prepared and getting everything together is uh, one of the most important topics of, our, of all. So with that being said, then we move on to still, you know, your pre-scene um, stuff you need to consider, your data collection software, in this case, it's the Quick Map 3D. Um, you need to make sure that that's kept up to date. Um, on the right side of your screen, you're kind of seeing a uh, screen printout of a descriptor list. Uh, this actually is for Pocket Zone. 
but I've noticed through all the different types of surveying and software, they all kind of operate the same. They all allow you to put in your predefined descriptors if that's something that you do. Um, and here in this case, it's actually putting stuff on different layers and deciding what colors to use. Uh, you can get that complicated if you choose, or you can choose just simply to put in your descriptors and, and leave it at that. So when you're in the field, you can just tap on the descriptor you want and then shoot that point. So next, we're going to be arriving on scene. So we know that when we arrive on scene, you know, it can be very chaotic. So you have to kind of uh, take that deep breath, kind of look around, see what you have, find out who it is that called you to the scene, make contact with them, get an overall view from them of what they came across, of what they found, of what's important. Um, I know every agency kind of does things differently. With my agency, we actually had detectives that responded to the scene that would assist. We'd end up talking with them and getting their perspective of what was important to them as we walked around the scene and kind of looked at what we need to do, where possibly we can set up, where our evidence points are. If we do choose to set up in the particular spot we're thinking we might set up, can we do that without doing the station move? I prefer shooting my scene without doing a station move. Although a station move isn't that difficult, uh, it just cuts down the chance of making an error or uh, losing connection with your device and then having to start all over. Um, so I, although I have done station moves, I try to prevent those station moves. If I can get in one spot where I can shoot all my points, that's what I'm going to choose first. So then, of course, you move on after you decide where you're going to set up your instrument. The, the next important thing that comes up is your evidence points. Are you going to mark your evidence points or are you just going to shoot your individual points? Um, probably the last five to seven years when I was in the field, um, I did not mark my evidence points anymore. I just uh, shot the points. I knew where they were at. I told my prison person to walk whatever point I wanted to document, and I documented that spot. Uh, that became a personal preference for me. I found no reason to put paint on the ground or chalk on the ground or evidence markers. Uh, the reason for the chalk or the paint is, believe it or not, in the private sector now, because of laser scanners, you have these private people going out and scanning your scenes after you leave and then putting those online for sale to defense attorneys. So I looked at it as why do I want to make their life easier so they can actually gather everything I did because they can't close the road down. They have to sit up on the side of the road. But with those laser scanners, they're able to actually pick up those evidence points, paint marks you put on the roadway. So I try to make things a little more difficult for them. So I don't know if uh, Dale has anything to add as far as setting up at the scene or marking his evidence. On the evidence, I'm, I agree with George on his personal preference. Uh, a lot of times, some agencies have you to mark it. The agency I used to work with, we had to mark all the evidence, then map it, and then we mark it again. We're doing the stuff redundantly. And I kind of agree doing it. The quicker you can do it without marking it, it makes it easier. You get the road open back up. And once you have it, you've got it. So you should be good. And all your points should be uh, backed up by your photographs anyway. So now that we're talking about photographs, as far as photographing your scene, um, our personal uh, setup at our department was we photographed the scene first, and then for the guys that were still marking the scene, once the scene was photographed, then they'd actually go out and start to mark the scene with either lumber crayons or reflective paint. Once that was done, then they would actually go out and shoot all the evidence points once they were marked to make sure that they were uh, documented with a photograph. Um, things have gotten a lot easier from when I started uh, working traffic division many years ago. Now, because we're talking about digital cameras. We used to be constrained with film, and sometimes you might be at a scene with maybe either 12 or a 24 exposure roll of film. 
Now, you, as long as you have memory cards, you can take as many pictures as you feel are necessary. And too many is never an issue. It always comes up that there are too few pictures taken, and that still comes today with people that just don't see the overall picture. Of course, taking pictures at night presents another problem if you're not uh, trained up on your camera on how to shoot at night, but if you are, then obviously you're going to take your night pictures. But another thing I always like to do is at any night scene is I like to go back out during the daytime, or if that wasn't available to me, I would have somebody who's working day watch go out and re-photograph the scene, um, and then I would look at those pictures, because sometimes you can see more marks than you're actually able to see at the time when you were there at night. Uh, those alternate light sources that we use, such as those really high-powered flashlights, actually sometimes wash out those scuff or skid marks or little scrape marks where you actually don't see them because the light is so bright. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. So now we have our station set up. So obviously when you decide, as we talked about earlier, we're going to pick our spot that's going to uh, avoid any type of station move if possible. Know your equipment and its limitations. And what I mean by that is how far can you shoot? And actually, most equipment can shoot well over 1,000 feet. Um, I have found, though, over the thousands of scenes that I've shot, the average ones tend to be between about three to 500 feet. I have shot scenes uh, over 1,500 feet but that is a rarity. So then once you decide your location of where you're going to set your equipment, the next thing you need to do is you need to mark your station location with some type of marker. This is very important because you may have to go back out to the scene. Uh, somebody may come along and kick your tripod, knock your instrument out of the level, and you've shot half your scene, maybe 100 points. You don't want to have to start over. You want to stay within the same job. So with our department, they're required to mark their location with a PK nail, which is just really a heavy-duty concrete nail that's sold at most surveying stores. You can even find them online. Um, they are a lot thicker than the actual concrete nails you'd find at like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or other type of hardware store. They also have a little dimple on top that actually allows the prism pole tip on the bottom of the pole to fall within that little dimple because our equipment mapping, this laser equipment, is that precise. It's also magnetic, so if your city crews or county crews were to come out and slurry seal the road where you wouldn't be able to see that shiny nail anymore, if you contacted your local uh, street crews that have the magnetic wands, they could actually go out and find that nail for you again if it became necessary. And, of course, if all else fails and all you have left is a lumber crayon, then you obviously can mark your spot with the lumber crayon. I've seen guys, when they were out of nails, would actually put a penny on the ground in the spot that their station was set up and then spray over the top of that penny or a washer or some other object to actually make a nice distinctive mark on the ground to where their instrument's at. Then, of course, with that, then you move on to your reference point. Um, you know, the reference point, as far as how I've always looked at it, um, is should be a north reference point. It should be towards north. Keeping in mind this uh, equipment was kind of expanded upon from the surveying side. In the surveying field, they really didn't care where north was. They were just looking for a common reference point because they would go back to the same construction site numerous times to locate or document uh, points as the job was moving along. Uh, with us, we tend to go out to the scene once, maybe twice, but we also want our diagram with north going to the top. So that's what actually sets your instrument up or your zero heading facing towards the north. This point should also be marked. And it also should be somewhere between 25 to 50 feet away. Uh, it could be 75 feet. If you're in a small cul-de-sac where you had a fatal crash, maybe it's only 15 feet away. But it is important to have a zero reference point, and it should be to the north. 
and you need to measure it with a tape measure. This is something that uh, is coming up more and more as now on the defense side, they're becoming more knowledgeable about total stations and how they work um, and how they're going to attack that. Um, so they have a tendency to argue about accuracy. And this is an easy way to show your instrument was working correctly. With my department and the manual that I created, officers have to set up that north reference. They're going to shoot that as their first point. And then when they're done shooting all evidence points and they are down to no more shots are necessary, they reshoot that north point. They should pretty much line right up on top of each other. That's a way to show that, I don't know what happened here. You know, Paul? Um, I don't. You might have to go just to reshare your uh, PowerPoint screen. I'm not sure why it would go out on you. I don't know what happened either, George. It just kind of disappeared on us. It logged me out. I'll tell you what, I could, um, let, me, let me do the share and I'll kind of go back to that uh, presentation slide that you were at. Just give me a second here. So just give me a second here, and I will be sharing that screen. Okay. Here we go. See that okay? There we go. I believe this is where you left off, correct? Okay. Yes. So with that being said, um, that's a way for you as an officer, once you've downloaded your scene, you can actually go into your drawing and you can actually use whatever type of measure tool your drawing program has, uh, measure from your instrument to your north reference. And it should be within an inch or two of actually what you measured with your tape measure. You'll be able to show that at the beginning the instrument was working correctly and at the end it was working correctly. This is just something to combat what a defense attorneys uh, like to attack in court is because they, that's what they do. So we try to cut that down to show that our instrument was working at the beginning, at the end. Kind of the same thing as when you're using an LTI speed laser, that officer confidence check you want to do at the beginning and end of your shift. So with that, we can move on to the next slide. So here, as you see that uh, we're talking about marking, um, the reason why I have this photograph up is this uh, create a lot of heartache on our department because it's talking about whether you want to mark it, how you're going to mark it, whether you're going to use evidence markers, lumber crayons, or just shoot the points. In this particular case, you can see some of those evidence marker little tents that are out there, the little yellow ones that the crime scene people like to use a lot. Well, in this case, an officer was shooting a scene. The officer that was helping him or working, walking around with the prism had never been trained on how to use any of this equipment. So the officer decided he was going to put out these little markers and just tell the guy, you need to go over to point one or point two. And while they were doing that, the other officer that was assigned to take photographs took photographs. Well, obviously, when this was going to trial, the defense got a hold of all this information, and then they hired a private reconstructionist who then re re basically drew this scene from all this information they got from the police reports, and the evidence points weren't lining up. Well, nobody in the report let anybody know that those evidence markers really weren't evidence markers. They were just a visual cue for where he wanted the prism guy to go. So as we all know, cops find the most unique ways of confusing people. So their evidence marker number one that they had out there had nothing to do with where the station was set up and their number two and their number three. 
So it got very confusing. So that's why you need to make sure on what you're doing that uh, everybody knows what you're doing. So that's where I kind of got most of my guys to stop with actually marking because this was another major issue that was happening is that guys just started throwing things out there and then photographs were taken and then there was no documentation of what that stuff actually was used for. Hey, George, um, I actually have a, a, a comment or a question that came through, so I'd like to just quickly address sure. that with what you just said. Um, if you're shooting the same point twice, start and end, then wouldn't you open yourself up to an argument that the points are not exactly the same by, def by the defense? Uh, the two points would likely be slightly different. That's the comment that just came out. No. no, it, do it does not, because you're going to be less than an inch. Uh, our accuracy with a laser instrument measuring device, the accuracy is much higher than actually what you measure with a tape measure. You're just showing that the instrument is actually working correctly. So if you're finding something um, less than an inch difference or a couple hundredths of a tenth difference, um, you know, you're good because you're going to get those little variances because the first time and the second time with that prison hole, if that guy does not get that little bubble exactly within the center, then yes, you will have just a little bit. You're, if it's a hot day, your station may settle a little bit and its level may be off just a little bit, but not enough to where the instrument's not going to let you keep shooting. Um, that's acceptable in the industry. Uh, if you talk to any engineer, they'll also let you know that, uh, you know, that's built-in tolerances. So that's nothing that um, I've ever been concerned about. That's an issue that's never been raised because whether it's 25 feet one-tenth or 24 feet nine-tenths, you know, you, you, you're only going to see it if you zoom in real close to your diagram. So that never really becomes an issue. But we've had people that did not do that check and you know, they had a few points that were off, and then, you know, that's when the argument started coming up. So that's why we had our people start doing that. There still is no standard out there as far as calibrating your equipment when it comes to crime scenes or collision scenes. So one of the things our department does before I left was we established that our instruments will be sent out and calibrated once a year. Uh, in the private sector, and the surveyors, the only time they take their equipment to a shop is when it's not working. Otherwise, they just use it because it's highly accurate equipment. Hopefully, that answers their question. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, George. So we can move on to the next slide. So this just uh, expands a little more on evidence numbering. Um, here you can see that they have their evidence markers out there, one, and we got a three, and a seven, and a six, and a five. Um, you know, if you choose to mark your evidence, that's fine. Um, it's an individual choice. But it may be a division standard that your department puts in place that you have to mark your evidence, which there's no problem with that. But remember to take your photographs before and after you mark your evidence to show what it looked like before the markers were put out there and then after. Um, then of course you want to um, make sure that uh, like in this case, we got numbers. Keeping in mind that whether you're using Quick Map or Pocket Zone, those data collection software are already using numbers to keep track of the physical measurements, the X, Y, and the Z in the horizontal or, or height plane. Um, so when you shoot evidence, when you do your third shot, it's automatically given assigned to number three. So if you put a three out there, now you're actually going to have two threes. The number three within quick map and then your evidence point number three. And we had an officer that did this, and it actually was very confusing because, if I remember correct, it started like at point 12, and it went to like point 19, and they were all like right next to the same point numbers that pocket zone is signed. So it got very confusing on which was a point number and which was an evidence number. So I've always recommended just use the alphabet. So if you're going to 
not actually, because I found some officers don't like typing in like skid mark or left front tire V1 or whatever descriptor that they use. They want to just shoot it and do a handwritten evidence legend, which is fine. They, some people feel that is um, faster for them. But uh, um, I just recommend using the alphabet. It just makes things uh, a lot easier. So then they can do their little handwritten evidence legend using A through Z. And then what they normally do, because there's a few guys in my department that preferred that, was back at the scene, um, would then create their evidence legend from their handwritten notes, kind of like the old school way. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, everybody has their own style, how they want to do it. Uh, the officers that do that, they just personally feel that they can do things faster. I don't know if Dale has anything to add on that. I, I agree with using the um, alphabet instead of the numbers just for the particular point of uh, the mix-up and hard to explain it in court. Also, some departments still like to use the number system. I always recommend to follow departmental policy, but if at all possible, try to stay at the We've got the drop-down menus now on most of the software data collectors, which makes it so much easier. It's quicker doing it that way than trying to have to go back and explain once a person gets used to familiarize with their, with their equipment. So with that, we can move to the next slide. So you can here you can see in this particular photograph, the officer used some evidence markers and he placed them next to his evidence points. He also circled them with the yellow crown, which there's no problem with that. That's obviously this officer's style. But what comes up next is, and what's come up quite a bit is, do I shoot my roadway geometry first or do I shoot my evidence first? Um, I know Dale and I have talked about this before. There's really no right or wrong. Um, it's all in what you prefer or what circumstances arises. Um, Sometimes I've shot all my roadway geometry first and then went on to the evidence. And then sometimes I've shot my evidence first because it was a smaller scene um, and we needed to get the, um, the crew out there that's going to clean up the biohazard. So we want to get them out there to get that cleaned up right away. So I might shoot my evidence first so they can get to work and then shoot my uh, roadway geometry last. That's just a personal preference. So the road so with that, with the same. Go ahead, Dale. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, if nothing else, sometimes you, all you can do is shoot the uh, or map the evidence. You might have to come back the next day to even get the roadway geometry. As long as you get several reference points in, you should be able to come back. And nothing else, you could merge both diagrams to bring them together if you have to go through that, all that big process. But most yeah, that's road, true. Road, Road geometry won't change overnight, and usually if it does, we're aware of that uh, several weeks ahead of time. So as long as we know something happens, we can actually go back the following day and get roadway job, as long as we've got plenty of uh, reference points tomorrow. That is true, and that's why it's also a good practice to also, like I talked about earlier, is marking your station, marking your north reference, and you can actually go out there and shoot the same scene uh, using those same two spots, you can actually reopen up. I know within Quick Map and Pocket Zone, the uh, same job, and just place yourself back in that job and just continue to shoot. Or if you have some known references, you can also um, set up in another spot, shoot those known references, and then just merge those two jobs together. So with that, we can move on to the next slide. So now you can see here that they've decided they're going to set up. This is actually an intersection. Um, it's a vehicle ped crash. The officer set up his awning so he could be in the shade. It was a hot day in San Diego at this particular time. And they were having problems communicating. They could not get their equipment to work. Eventually they called me and I showed up and actually was able to figure out that the cable that he was using actually had some at least one broken wire inside, and that's why nothing was working. So uh, 
I gave him the extra cable that I had, and then he went on to shoot, shooting the scene. Um, but those are some of the things that the more scenes you shoot, um, the more, unfortunately, the more times that things doesn't work. Sometimes people are able to figure it out. It's just stuff you have to put in that little toolbox or tool bag you carry around. Now, you know, how can I get my stuff to work? Um, I know with um, mapping equipment, a lot of times it's really it's just the setup. Once you do your setup and you zero set your instrument and you shoot that first point, usually most cases you should be able to shoot the entire scene unless you have a battery issue. Um, it's usually that initial setup. A lot of times it's officers just um, not following the step-by-step -step directions that either they were trained or the little manual they have. That's why in my department I create a little cheat sheet that walked them, you know, from beginning to end. And, um, you know, a lot of times the officers, um, I've had phone calls in the middle of the night. Turns out officers failed to actually plug the cable all the way in. I've had that. Um, sometimes it's been Bluetooth, although recently Bluetooth has gotten very secure over the last couple of years. But when they first started using Bluetooth, that uh, created a lot of problems because Bluetooth was so unstable and would lose connection. And that's why we stuck with cables for many years. Now we're actually doing Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So you just got to make sure that you have some type of little cheat sheet that is the common things that your equipment um, causes uh, communication problems. And to know what it is that's uh, causing your issue. What's, what's not communicating or what's not working so they know, you know what to look at and know what they need to do or what they can change. Uh, a lot of times officers, because we're problem solvers, you know, that's what we do. Um, sometimes they go in and they start changing things that um, shouldn't be changed, that they're set in stone, um, such as the bowed rate and those things within the communication. Those are defaults, and sometimes officers start changing those, which just makes things worse when the entire time it was just a cable that wasn't plugged in. I'm sure Dale's got some examples as well. Well, a lot of people get, uh, get up frustrated and really excited when something doesn't work and they kind of panic and they overlook the obvious. I've had the problem I see with people working out the field when something goes wrong and it's not going back and taking their time and checking to see what happens with it. Or the, it did they lose Bluetooth? Are they supposed to be on the Wi Fi instead of Bluetooth? And one thing that we found out, um, a couple years ago, we were actually mapping the scene out. We were at, on a college campus, and there was, we didn't think about this, we couldn't keep our connection going. And we finally figured out there was about eight or 900 different Bluetooth and Wi-Fi devices interfering with us. We had to back away from the scene a little bit farther and set our instrument up. And once we did that, we were able to map. So sometimes that little thing is just by having too many Bluetooth or Wi-Fi applications close by can cause a big issue. And once you discover that, you utilize your equipment, back away from the scene a little bit farther, and you still go ahead and map and continue through without having the issue. Another thing we find out is the instrument will get off off level just by just enough to cause it not to pick anything up. You think you're still mapping, but you're actually not. People are not paying attention to the data collectors, and whenever you uh, start mapping a point and it doesn't, Put it on the data collector. The first thing I want to go would look at is my instrument set up correctly. Did I come off level? Come off level by just enough of an error to cause it to do that. That's one of the biggest issues I've seen where people uh, bump into the tripod a little bit or move the instrument just a fraction of an inch, and it causes everything to go off kilter. And just taking the time and going back and set, setting back up, you should be good to go. Great. Thanks, uh, Dale. Um, George, we had a, a comment when you mentioned um, your mapping guide. Um, we have a, a, an attendee that says, would George be willing to share his mapping guide that he has for his department? We've made one and would just like to see others as well. So if that is an availability, I, I see that um, who's asked for that or maybe we could upload it with the, um, this presentation and the recording um, in about a week. So, George, you can let us know if you would be okay. willing to do that. 
Okay, I know that at one time several of my uh, mapping guides and quick guides were on LTI's website for the older style with the impulse and the angle encoder. So I'm not sure if you still have those links up there or not. Um, I'll have to double check. I'll definitely follow up with that and um, do as a follow-up email to everybody who's attended regarding that. Okay. Yeah, because some of it's gotten outdated now because of what Microsoft has done, because some of it was on how to um, sync your device. A lot of that's kind of gone away. But as far as the step-by-step -step directions, I know it had that for the, uh, the impulse and the LR200 along with the angle encoder and with quick map. Okay, great. So we can move on to the, of course we talked a lot about this. We can actually go on to the next slide which was the quality check and that's okay. kind of what um, you can see here we've talked about before, Dale talked about, it's still, these are like really the common issues that we see that come up, whether it be the devices stop communicating or sometimes people lose power. Some of the instruments you need to know, so you should um, go out in your parking lot and actually set up and shoot and then pretend that maybe your laser lost power and you need new batteries. Swap it out, see what happens. See if you're able to keep shooting. See what happens if your data collector goes dead and then so you plug it in. Is your scene still going to be on the data collector or are you going to be starting from scratch? Don't wait for that to happen when you're actually out in the field. You know, is your compass heading correct? Did you zero set your instrument to the north? Um, what does that look like on your data collector? What should it always look like? You know, I know for many years, you know, I know that when I shoot, it's going to place my instrument on my scene, little screen and my north reference will be to the top of the screen. So then I actually know that I've got my point. Is your instrument level, um, did it go out of level? Do you know how to get it back into level and then how to get back to the main screen? You know, all lasers are a little bit different. The device is a little bit different on what you have to do to get back to that point. Um, some of them have an escape key. Some of them simply, once you're back to level, you can just keep shooting. So you want to experiment with that so you know what to do if it actually happens to you out in the field. So with the quality check, we can go to the next slide. So you can actually see, this is kind of what Dale was talking about earlier as well when he was out at his scene. You know, this is a scene that actually I shot. Um, I always like to not just shoot my points, but I always like to connect my points with lines. This is an actual screenshot from a scene that I shot. And you can see that all my points that are curb lines are connected. My crosswalk lines are connected. My dash lines are connected, double yellows, fencing. I have them all connected when I'm out in the field. And I can actually see this on my data collector. And so if I were to shoot a point that I expected to be in between one of those traffic lanes and it ends up towards the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen, that would actually let me know that, hey, wait a minute, something went wrong here. Either I missed my prism or something happened with the software or something happened with my laser. So I need to figure out what happened. If I see it right away, you know, I can look at my laser and see what distance it got. That might help me. Uh, you know, sometimes people walk in between or they're carrying something or you just, the person that was shooting actually just missed the prism. They were just off of it and they actually got a reflection off of the building or a sign. It could even be a road sign that's highly reflective and they actually got their point off of that. So then on the next slide, we can see where it just shows, when we go to the next slide, um, an example of both. So it's all in what you decide, what you find easier. We have guys in my department that still do the bottom. They don't connect their points. They just shoot, shoot all their points. And then when they get back to the office, then they start connecting them all together. On the top, that's personally how I shoot my scene. And this is the same scene. All I did was just turned off the 
line work, so you couldn't see the line, so you can see the difference. And this is pretty straightforward. It's a square intersection, so it doesn't look quite as complicated. And there wasn't a whole terrible amount of uh, evidence points, but I have some that uh, you can have uh, so many evidence points that it really gets complicated. So when I started with LTI back in the early 2000s, the initial uh, data collection software that we all were using didn't allow you to connect points. So now it allows you to connect points with lines. So I, uh, I prefer sheeting with lines. Um, I found it very cumbersome to constantly zoom in and zoom out to find my points and to figure out which points were connected and which points were, were not connected. But, you know, once again, that's a uh, personal preference. I don't know if hey, George, Dale has um, anything to add on that. Yeah, maybe, Dale, before you comment on that, I just had a couple questions I'd like to address, um, and we might need some clarification. Uh, one question that did come through was asking about, wouldn't the readings be more accurate with the prism set as low as possible? And I'm not sure if, um, George, do you understand that question of how to address that, or maybe yes, we sir. can have to clarify? Go ahead. Uh, no. The, the prism height, whether you're shooting at a one-foot prism or a 20-foot prism. The height doesn't make the change because uh, the laser inside is, is doing the Pythagorean theorem, and it's doing that on every shot. So it's going to be doing the cosine of the angle times the horizontal distance to give the true x or flat line distance. And then it also does the sine of the angle of the horizontal distance to give the height change. So. The physical height of the prism is not going to affect your accuracy. This equipment, as LTI engineers have explained to me, is extremely accurate. It's way more accurate than we could ever measure with a tape measure. When it comes to accuracy, accuracy is all on the user. Uh, what I have found which causes the biggest problem is usually the prism guy himself not holding the, the prism absolutely level. Some people uh, will allow their prism pole to sway back and forth, whether it gets closer or further away or left or right, and that's going to actually change the actual position of that shot. So that's from the prism, the person holding the prism pole. As your instrument gets at a level, that also can affect your accuracy, but you're talking about generally thousands of an inch because the engineers have already built in to the software that when it gets out of level too much to where the accuracy is affected, that's like what Dale was talking about earlier, it actually won't do a shot. Some of them just give you, will give you an error message or an error tone. Um, so you have to learn what your equipment does when it's at a level and it's not giving you the shot. But the, as far as the height of the prism, whether you're shooting down to one foot down or to 20 feet up, that does not change the accuracy. It's all on that prism guy. With our equipment on my department and what I always got the LTI salesmen to do when they were selling equipment is to also always make sure they provided those bipod legs that you attach to the prism poles. Those really help people. Um, keep that prism pole level, waiting for that shot to be done. Now, we have guys in my department that did not like using those bipod legs, like just hold it, and um, we would do some training, and we would compare scenes, and you're absolutely right. The person that was holding that prism pole freehand, a lot of times their, their curb shots, you can see how they fluctuated. So. You would look at that line, and you knew it was a straight line, but they would have wavy lines, and that comes from that prism swaying back and forth. They may think they're holding it straight, but it's pretty hard to hold, just stand there holding the pole straight while the person shooting is getting the laser locked in in that prism than actually doing the shot. What do you think, Dale? I agree. I like the bipod legs, legs with that keeps it uh, steady. A lot of prism sway, if you do have a lot of sway with it, you're going to have uh, your data is going to be completely off. It can be off 
tremendously bad. And I highly encourage you to use the uh, my fault legs anytime I use a credit card. So now here's just another example of here's the of the previous slide we were looking at. This is actually the finished diagram. So you can see that you know it wasn't an overly complicated one, but that's what your scene looks like after you draw it. So you know it, it's all in personal preference or style, shall we say? Um, but like I said, I started out with LCI many many years ago. Um, mapping without able to connect points and would spend hours at, back at the station just trying to connect all my curb lines and my roadway lines together. And once they figured out how to allow you to connect these points with lines out in the field, that's just my preference now. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I just find it a lot easier for me and then when I'm shooting, I can actually see my intersection start to build before me. Um, sometimes these guys that don't do that, they end up um, moving their station and not realizing it, and then the angles are off, and then they don't realize until they get back to the office when they start drawing, one leg of the intersection is in the completely wrong spot, and then they end up having to go back out and reshoot in their roadway geometry. So that's why I like connecting my points so I can actually see it on my data screen. How do you feel about that, Dale? I mean, too, if you, if you see the lines, you make sure everything is working correctly and everything is uh, falling in geometry right. The, one of the big so now we'll we talk. Have... Go ahead, George. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dale. Yeah. Okay, one thing that um, we talked about is, I talked about much about transfer and saving the data. I'd highly recommend when you start, first start pulling up your instrument and take your data collector up, have it to save automatically. And whenever you save it, uh, if you want to go to the next screen, please, um, save it in all file formats. There's a, based on the LCI system, you can pull down different formats. You've got DXF, text files, raw files, uh, PNG files. Save all those file formats. Whether you use them or not, I, was, I keep them saved in every format with it. That way, just in case the defense side needs a specific one, we can have it. The main thing to save is your raw file. That is the must. That's the big one. That's the one we get introduced in the court into evidence. Whenever we save it, I would save the raw file and it's on a particular disk of, of its own to keep into evidence. This way, uh, if anybody needs it for the raw file for court, We've got the raw file. If we need another type of file, we can go back and pull it out. But it is a must. We want to treat these files as evidence. If you have a evidence locker, uh, make sure you get it uh, put into evidence, submitted. This way, because everything is discoverable by the defense attorney, and we need to have it uh, have it on file. Also, whenever you transfer this, you can transfer it either by email or by the cables. And I found out I always try to uh, transfer mine before I leave the scene to my laptop, and I can pull it up and make sure that everything I have got before I break my, my uh, mapping system down. That way I've got everything. I know for sure it transferred over. All my points are good. My diagram looks reasonably accurate, and I feel good at that point. So I, I try to go back and get everything transferred over to my laptop prior to leaving the scene. And if you go to the next slide, um, You've got, we've got to already talked about that. George talked about the manual. That is a good idea to at least have your manual in your uh, map equipment while you're on scene. That way, you, in case anything comes up, you've got a quick check you can run with and you can uh, bounce off it. Yes, yeah, there, was, there was a number of reasons why this came up. Um, there were some newer officers that came to our division and they just, they didn't see the importance of it, and some of them actually, you know, would, would get in some heat and arguments thinking that, you know, they didn't have to provide that. They just uh, lost sight of that the defense has the right to all this information. You need to have a manual so you can hold your people accountable when they make the mistake so you can correct that mistake so it doesn't happen again so it's, so it's there. Uh, 
So we came up with a system that our traffic investigative sergeant every year goes in and deletes out the two years back information off of the data collectors or the total stations. Um, our department has the luxury. We have a lot of different equipment. I wrote a grant and got a lot of LTI mapping equipment for our department, and then some other guys that wanted other things got some other uh, equipment. But we basically wrote user's manuals for all of it, and um, part of that is that at the end it talks about just what Dale was talking about. Our guys have to create a CD, and they have to put on that CD the raw file, the PZD file, the TXT file, the CZD file, and the PZD file, and impound that as evidence, because the defense has the right to that. The raw file is always the actual physical measurement that the laser did when it took the measurement, because a lot of times this data collection software kind of converts it um, over to a Cartesian coordinate system, which is a little bit easier for it to actually plot the point. But they have the right to all that. And so now that it's within a manual, it holds them accountable to that standard, and then we don't have to worry about that later. And also then it gives, makes it easier for detectives if they need to come back and get that information. Okay, guys, we've got a, just a couple more minutes. I just want to uh, make everyone mindful of maybe just uh, wrapping this up and then leaving a couple minutes extra over for, uh, for some additional questions. So just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, okay. We, 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 on this topic here, we've already talked about it, about the uh, North Era. One thing I would like to leave with before we close out is take your equipment and practice. Train with it. Go out and practice. The more you use it, the more familiar you are with it, the more comfortable you get. If you don't use it, you, uh, the old saying goes, you don't use it, you lose it. And I'd highly recommend practicing uh, using this as much as possible. That is true. Make sure that you, um, you get properly trained by somebody. There's trainers all across the country that can provide training in this rather than just having somebody train you that got trained by somebody that got trained by somebody that got trained by somebody. I've gone to departments and was shocked at the way they were doing business, that it was so out of the, the norm. It was just unbelievable. And a lot of times they're doing stuff that's taking them hours that they, if they were trained properly, could probably do in 30 minutes or less. So training is a must, and can't emphasize that enough. Awesome. So you guys, I'm just going to open up the, the poll one more time. So the, the very first poll question was more about if you'd like just a certificate of completion. Uh, this poll that I'm going about to open is more if you are interested in submitting for the ACTAR credit for this course. So everybody who stayed online with us, um, Definitely did the full um, hour. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this poll right now. You should see it on the screen. Talking about if you're interested in submitting for the ACTAR credit. And the difference to that would be you will also, you'll get that uh, certificate um, of completion, but then you will also uh, receive kind of the, um, the outline. So you have two separate PDFs that are required um, when you go to the ACTAR website and uh, make your submission. Um, the cost is five bucks if you're not aware. Um, that's the, um, the, the website there for the ACTAR um, continuing education. And again, it's going to require two PDFs. One's going to be kind of that the hourly schedule outline of today's um, agenda and then that um, certificate. So everyone can just uh, take a few moments here. Um, let us know if you're interested um, in that certification or, or if you're interested in applying for that credit. I'll just keep that poll open just for a second here. Um, and just want to plug our upcoming webinar series. Um, the next one uh, will be um, pretty thorough. It, it's going to kind of go into more of the diagramming side. I know we really just uh, scratched the surface here today. Um, but we are going to have a, a webinar that's just dedicated to diagramming 101. Um, it is going to be featuring the Ferrozone product as well as the IMS uh, MAP360. A lot of tips and tricks. We're most likely going to be doing a screen share uh, to really show you kind of um, um, how some other experts are, are, are dealing with, um, you know, importing the, the field data into a CAD program. So I think this would be highly beneficial, um, you know, for you guys to join as well. And then if you are interested in that, you should have uh, received that same registration link. You could have registered um, for this already. If not, you can certainly go back to that website and uh, make sure you get your name in there as well.
Okay. And then with that said, I'm just going to leave this uh, open up for some for contact information of our guest speakers, uh, George and Dale. I know uh, it wasn't quite the, the smoothest start, but we got it going, and I really appreciate everyone's uh, patience on some technical difficulties that we've experienced. Um, but uh, I'm going to just now, of course, just leave it open for any uh, questions anybody else has or any other comments. I did see one um, come through. Let's see. Um, if we pre-shoot intersections, can we use them for a crash? That would be a question for one of our, uh, from one of our attendees, if you guys want to handle that one. You can. If you yes, pre -shoot absolutely. By doing the pre-shoot, you make your template with it, and what you can do is, as long as you have reference points, you can go out and just uh, plot your evidence and then bring it in and merge it into the template, which will make it save you a lot of time. I highly recommend if you have a, uh, intersections or roadway section where you have a lot of crashes, go ahead and make you a template with it. So when you do make the template, make sure you plot in all your uh, various reference points so you can use it uh, to bring your evidence in top of the template. Yes, we have a number of templates and um, what I got my guys in the habit of doing was shooting all the expansion joints of the curb returns at the corners of the intersection and they can actually make those their common points. So once you have the intersection shot, they can go out, um, kind of shoot a few of those points and then just shoot their evidence. And I know within uh, our zone, it actually allows you to merge two jobs together. But you do need to have at least three common points to be able to do that. Great. I had another question. It might be, uh, it's, again, it's pretty overall. Like, roughly how long does it take to map? Uh, I think there were talking about the scene that you showed, uh, George, early in the presentation. Roughly how long did it take to map that particular scene? Uh, that was quite a while ago. Maybe, you know, most of my scenes I found I was able to do uh, within about two to three hours. But, uh, you know, keeping in mind, I've been using laser equipment since 2001, so I've mapped thousands of scenes. Um, I know watching other people shoot, you know, they might take maybe an hour longer than me, maybe a little bit less. You know, it's like Dale talks about, you got to practice. The more you practice, the quicker you become. Um, one of the things I used to always point out, I had this one guy on my squad, he liked to work the prism, so uh, we got to the point where we could just, use hand signals, we didn't even have to talk. And, you know, he knew what I needed and he knew where to go. I could just kind of point. And so it made things a lot faster. Great, thanks. Um, I think that's it as far as questions that we're caught up for, but we can certainly still stay in line here. Um, if anybody else has any additional questions or comments, uh, please use that chat feature. I think we were able to keep up on most of them. That, that came through. So um, again, we'll just uh, keep it open here just for a second here. So I do want to thank, um, of course, our guest speakers for joining us today, George and uh, Dale. Thanks for your time and putting together this content. And just let everyone else know as well, we will have this uh, recorded. The PowerPoint uh, will be available, and we'll be sending out a, a reminder email of when that's going to be available on a, um, a laser technology blog. So we'll drive you to a link where you can review the um, the actual webinar and uh, or download the actual presentation. So that will be available in about a week from now. So uh, we'll, we'll let everyone know uh, when that is available via email. So I think with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up again. George and Dale, thanks so much. And uh, if you guys have any, uh, any comments, uh, go ahead and make that. It's a pleasure to get to do this. And thanks everybody for being patient with Thanks, everybody. Hopefully you learned a little something to make your life a little easier when you're shooting scenes with your mapping equipment. Have a great day. Great. Thanks, guys. We're going to go ahead and end the session now.